Solidity Auditor in Open Zeppelin, then I worked uh, with Aragon for a bit, and now I'm working with synthetics, mainly addressing the problem of how do you build a, a super complex um, smart contract system in a way that you can iterate through it and fix bugs and, and improve and experiment. Um, and other than that, I, I consider myself a bit of a, an educator in the space. I just, it's not that I know a lot of things, I, I just, love to empower other people with, with knowledge, right? So what we're gonna do today is talk about proxies uh, and then, like in general, and then we're gonna uh, talk about a pretty sophisticated uh, type of proxy that we're using in synthetics. So I think that it's critical for, for everyone to understand how proxies work under the hood I think that it's not okay for a dev to use proxies and not know how they work. But the good news is it's that they're really easy. Like, in the end, there's like no mystery. It's very easy to demystify it, right? So I, I insist, uh, be, besides the proxy I'm gonna show, I think the, the essence of this talk is to, to promote the awareness of how proxies work and if you're going to use one, like, make sure that you understand how they work. So to illustrate this, we're going to play them. Like, we're going to start with a, with a very simple contract and make it upgradable and see what happens. So this is the contract. I don't know if it's a good idea to bring in code to a, a talk, but I don't know if you can see it. But it's just a contract that sets a value, right? It has a function set value. Uh, you can set the value, and it records who set the value. It's message sender, and it emits an event. That's it. So this, co this contract is deployed at the 0x1 address, right? And then after deploying it, Bob calls uh, set value 42, right? Then 42 is set in storage slot 0 because the variable is declared. It's the first variable declared. And uh, 0x Bob, which is the address of Bob, uh, gets stored in the second slot, which is slot one, okay? That's how Solidity uh, lays out storage automatically when you declare variables in a contract. Uh, and an event is emitted from 0x1. Now they decide to make their contract upgradable, all right? How does this work? They, they decide to deploy a proxy which is just a, uh, a contract that has a function. You can tell it what the current implementation is, which is going to be the other contract. And then it has a, like a magic assembly uh, function, which forwards anything using call to the implementation contract. So this is deployed at 0x2. Then Bob calls set implementation 0x1. And in the proxy storage, slot 0 now holds 0x1 because the address implementation variable is declared in slot. It is the first variable one declared, so it's saved in slot zero. Then uh, they're now connected. This is the proxy, and this is implementation. And Bob calls value, right? It forwards the call to that uh, implicit getter that Solidity generates. And it returns, returns 42, which is expected, right? Yeah. Now, uh, Bob calls set value 1337. Let's see what happens. Uh, it gets forward using call to the set value function in the implementation. And it affects the storage of the implementation, not of the proxy. And it stores 1337 in slot 0 and 0x2 in slot uh, 1. That's weird, right? That's message sender. So the, the problem that we have here is that call makes the execution context to be the implementation, not the proxy. Like the event is emitted from the, from the implementation, which is also not a good thing, right? Uh, because 
you don't want to have a protocol and, and, and tell people like to be changing addresses every time you update the implementation, right? So the problem that we have with this particular proxy that uses call is that the execution context is here, right? And we don't want that. So what is an execution context is when you run code, basically uh, what determines uh, which storage uh, space to use, uh, who message sender is, um, and where emits come out from, right? Um, there's more to it, but that's like pretty much it. So how can we take the proxy, the execution context to the proxy? We just need to use delegate call. So call runs the code that, that we're running in the current context, and delegate call runs the code in the context of the caller, right? So here we have a second proxy, right? Which is, it, the only difference is that it uses delegate call, right? It's deployed at 03, it's 0x3. It's connected to the implementation, the same one as before. And now when Bob calls set value 1337, it uses delegate call, so the execution context is this, right? We are using the storage space of the proxy, which is good. The event is coming from the proxy, which is good. Uh, now Bob calls value, the, like the getter, right? The execution context is still that, it's fine. Now, this is gonna delegate call to whatever is stored in the implementation. And the implementation is in slot zero, and the, the value now holds 1337, right? So what are we delegating call to? To some contract at 1337, which there's probably nothing there, right? So we just, we, we have a storage collision, right? We overwrote the address of the implementation with a number, right? So we basically bricked this proxy. Right? So delegate call is awesome, but it is dangerous because you have storage collisions. So to solve this, Bob goes to the next level and, and destructures the proxy storage. So what is destructuring? It's basically choosing where to put to, put, to store something. That's it. It's not using Solidity's uh, custom slots, but just choosing where you put it. Um, so for Solidity, first variable is at zero, second at one, et cetera. And you have infinite slots. Destructuring is just picking a custom slot, right? So we have the third proxy here. It's called unstructured proxy. And the difference is that we are not using Solidity's like regular storage slots, but we are declaring where we store things at slot 1000, right? And using that. The, the code looks a little bit weirder, but that's it. So we deploy this proxy, 0x4. We connect it to the implementation. Oh, this is important. Can you see the storage? It's the implementation address is stored at the custom slot of 1,000. So that's destructured right now. So now we call set value. It makes a delegate call. The execution context is that. We write the new value, values, but they don't like step over, let's say, the implementation address. Right? And the event comes from, from the proxy, which is fine. So we have a proxy that works, right? And now we can upgrade the implementation because we, we know that it works. So we have value holder v2. The only difference is that we added a new variable called date, right? Just added it on top. Uh, and just whenever someone sets the value, we also record, record when that happened, right? So now we connect the implementation. We call value, right? It delegate calls. Um, and value is whatever is stored at slot one, right? According to Solidity storage layout. And at one, we have CRX Bob. So another problem. Um, this is another type of storage collision. We shifted the, the implementation storage. Uh, 
and we have a collision between um, versions of the implementation, right? We have incompa incompatible storage layout. So Bob understands that to, to avoid this, you, in an implementation, you, you only append to the storage instead of like putting it anywhere, right? So he uh, moves the date variable to the end of the previous storage layout. Um, and that's it. That's pretty, a pretty simple fix. That's another rule of like, using proxies, always append to. Um, and now, this value is going to get whatever is stored at slot 0, which is 1337, so it's fine. So we, we avoided that collision. So storage collisions, it's, it's critical to understand when they occur. And it's basically the two types uh, of collisions that I just showed you. That's it. If you get that, you, you can pretty much think about any type of collision. Things to consider. The execution context is always the proxy, so everything is stored in the, in the proxy. Um, there's two types of collisions that we just talked about. Um, the first kind can be avoided by unstructuring uh, the storage layout. and the, the, se the second one can be avoided by just making sure that the uh, updates to the storage layout and the implementations is valid. Always append. And something to consider, and this is critical, multiple inheritance um, flattens your contracts so you cannot predict the storage layout. So you can add a new inherited contract to, you, to your like, super contract, and it can add like five new variables in an unpredicted uh, part of the layout. Uh, part of the layout. So it becomes hard to detect when you have invalid storage mutations, and you need to use tooling if you use proxies. I see a lot of people using proxies and not using tooling, and it's not a good idea. Uh, and even if you detect them, and this is not something that tooling fixes, um, it can be very hard, hard to avoid the invalid mutation. Like if you have an inherited contract and it, it causes this collision, to avoid it, you, you have to do some weird stuff, right? So why not use that technique of unstructuring on everything, not just the proxy storage, but the, the implementation storage definitions? So here we have value holder before the implementation before, and the difference is that it uses the same technique that the proxy used and stores everything at slot 5,000, right? Everything else is the same. So we deploy this, we connect it to our proxy, which we're not changing anymore because it works. Um, we call set value, right? It makes a delegate call to the implementation, and we can see that we have the gray uh, storage we're not using anymore. We have the proxy um, name, storage namespace, let's say, there, and the new implementation namespace uh, here. And they don't collide, right? So we've unstructured the implementation storage right now. We have, we're pretty happy with this proxy -like configuration. We, we, the, the context is kept at the proxy, and collisions are avoided using unstructured storage or storage namespace absolutely everywhere. Tooling should still be used to guarantee that there's like no uh, storage collision that you don't notice. But the thing is that uh, this like custom or manual use of storage uh, makes um, storage lay layouts much easier to control. So now that we understand these like basic principles of, of proxies, let's talk about like what a multi-contract system looks like in in Solidity. So there's no ideal standard solution for multi-contract systems. People often use registries, which is basically a contract that knows every other contract, right? And Whenever contract A needs to talk to contract B, it needs to go to the registry and ask, hey, I want to talk to B. Who's B? Here's B. 
and then it makes a call to contract B, right? And then B needs, if it's a, a sensitive operation, needs to say, okay, who's calling me? A, is A from the system? Uh, it asks the registry, the registry goes yes, and then, okay, then, then you can perform this. It's complicated, and it gets, it gets uh, messy pretty fast. So let's, let's try a pretty crazy solution, which is, uh, we're calling it the router proxy. Um, so we basically have a new contract, which is a, another contract that has one variable. It's called cooled value. And it's also using these, uh, this storage uh, uh, namespace system instead of Solidity's like, own uh, storage layout thingy. Um, but that's it. It just records a variable, right? Gets the store, sets the, the, the store's value, and emits a, an event. So we deploy it at 0x8. Uh, and then this is the tricky part. Bear with me with this part. Uh, Bob uses tooling to build a router, right? So this is basically a table, right? It has the addresses of the two contracts, uh, value holder and another contract, hard-coded. And its um, fallback function basically has to do like this binary search uh, algorithm to determine which implementation has that function, right? Is it value holder or is it another contract, right? And it just checks the incoming selector and forwards it to the appropriate implementation. And that's it. And then it, it just makes the, the regular delegate call pro, uh, proxy forwarding. So this is deployed at 0x9. And then we set the router as the proxy's implementation, right? 0x9 is the new implementation. And now we have this. We have the proxy over here. We have the router over here. And we have the implementations over here, right? So when Bob calls set value seven, you don't, I don't think you guys see it, but it's, it's calling set value seven with the number seven. It makes a delegate call to the, to the router, and then another delegate call to, the, to the, another contract implementation because the router figures out that the, the function set value is in that contract. Let's keep in mind that the execution context is still the proxy. It doesn't matter how many delicate calls you make. It will always be the, the, the entry point. So that works. Like it sets uh, the, the, uh, the other contract's uh, custom slot was, was 9,000. So it stores seven right there. And the event is still emitted from the, the execution context. So if Bob wants to upgrade the system, all he needs to do, like here we're making a, uh, like a silly change, right? We're, we're just multiplying the incoming value just by seven. Um, this new, another contract B2 is deployed at 0x10. A new router is generated by the tooling. It just has uh, the only difference is up there in, in another contract has a new address. Everything else is the same. And Bob sets the implementation of the proxy to that new router. So that's how you upgrade the, any contract in your system. So what would a more complex system look like? Maybe like this. You have the main proxy, right? You have the di different storage namespaces of that proxy. And then you have the router, which you keep changing every time you upgrade the system. And you have the different modules that specify uh, a particular behavior of your system. And then you have this thing, which is really cool, cool because uh, called mixins, because it allows intermodular communication in a way that we, we're going to see that's really efficient and really easy. Um, so yeah, we don't use any storage other than the execution context storage. Gas efficiency, uh, it's like a concern with this pattern because you're, used, you're doing two delay calls. Um, 
Keep in mind that transparent proxies, the ones almost everyone uses, uh, cost like 3,000 gas. Um, universal proxies, about 1,600. And this system uh, uses only uh, 2,600 gas, which is all right. Uh, and then intermodular, intermodular communications. How would a module talk to another module? You could, you could cast your module as the other module and just call its function because every module is this, this, the system. Uh, but the problem with this is that message sender would be lost because it's, it's a call. You, you break the delegate call chain, right? So you need to delegate call to the other module, just the, the same like self-casting mechanism, but with delay call. Uh, it works, but there's something much better, which is mixins, which are pieces of code that know how to interact with another module storage. They're like delegates for that particular part of the logic, right? And they're not deployed, they're just inherited. It's like module A inherits a bit of the code of module B. And the nice thing is that you can tell the mixin to interact with the other module uh, without even making a call. So the communication becomes super cheap. Let's, let's see an example. We have owner storage, which j just declares a struct with a single variable, uh, that mechanism to, to get custom storage slots. Then we have the owner mixin, which knows that storage and only has an only, only, only owner modifier, right? that does the typical check, right? And then in owner module, we inherit the mixin, which gives us the only owner modifier access, right? And we, we have a getter for the owner. And now we have a new version of value holder B5, right? That has a single change, which is we're using the only owner modifier here from another module using the owner mixing. If you want to use this, uh, you only have to change your code style a little bit. It's kind of weird, but uh, you get used to it fast because it's simple. Uh, you just need to use storage namespaces inst instead of like regular variables. Uh, and yeah, you get used to it. Um, should Solidity do this under the hood? There's a pro proposal from MaxSAM4. Um, so it, it is something that the Solidity team is considering. Uh, this could be a language supported feature to have like a contract hub. And yeah, why use the router? You don't have uh, contract size limitations anymore because you can just combine like, I think I, I tested it once with like 800 functions, which is pretty cra crazy. Um, it's like the router merges all the contracts into a single contract. So then, as we just saw, we have good, easy communications between the modules without having to use a registry or authentication or anything. It's ideal for complex experimental systems. And the other nice thing is that the router is, since the addresses are hard-coded, it's very explicit. So it's good for, for governance. If you want to make an update to the system, you show your community, like, this is what we're going to change. This is what the configuration of the system will look like. It's not hidden in some uh, dynamic storage somewhere. It's right there. Uh, and yeah, that's why we're using it as a core component of Synthetics B3, uh, because it's, it's a complex system that needs to not have all the complications of intermodular communications and all that. And well, if you want to try it out, it's a hard help plugin. It's uh, Synthetics B3 uh, hard hat router. It generates the router source. It manages storage namespaces for you. It performs validations to ensure that there's no, there are no storage collisions. And that's pretty much it. That's what the plugin does. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? I just want to know if I'm missing something, but this uh, proxy router could be the same as the uh, multi-faucet 
uh, proxy, you know, the Diamond proxy, but with the hard-coded uh, implementations. Uh, yes, I, I, I couldn't hear it perfectly, but I think you are asking about the Diamond proxy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is based on the Diamond proxy. So it, it's the, that, that, the Diamond proxy, but without getting the implementation from the storage, yeah. but instead hard-coding them, yeah, basically? Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 some people are calling the Diamond proxy a dynamic router, and this one a static router. And we like this one because uh, for our project, because it, it, it saves storage weeks, because the, the, the values are hard-coded, and it's also more explicit. Like, what we don't like about Diamonds is that you don't, like, if you're a community member or whatever, and you want to know what's the current composition of the system, you need to query it a lot. Right? But yeah, it's the same otherwise. Just one question. So you only use the sort of ints and addresses and stuff. What happens with mappings and arrays uh, in regards to storage collision? Sorry, can you repeat a bit louder? So if you have an array, yeah. does that affect storage collision? Well, if, if you declare your array or any dynamic type inside of those uh, storage namespace structs, uh, then Solidity's like regular storage layout um, system is used, which uh, uses unstructured storage under the hood. Like if you have a, a dynamic array, the position of that array, I think it's going to be its slot, say if it's 9003, because it's the third variable in your struct, uh, the hash of that, so it's going to be some other random place. So, it, probabilistically, the even though they're in, in structs, so some things are going to be spread out, but the, the probability of a collision is uh, very low, <laughs> like insignificant. So you mentioned a couple times that we should use tooling in order to check for storage collisions. What sort of tooling do you recommend contract developers use? Sorry, I, I can't hear really, really well from here. I'm just going to stand there. Okay, so in your talk, you mentioned a couple times that you should be using tooling in order to detect storage collisions. What sort of tooling should developers use in order to do these checks? Oh, sort of tools. Okay, um, yeah. So if you're using Open Zeppelin's proxies, you should use their tooling. If you're using uh, the router, uh, as you can see, we, we, just, we didn't just offer like a, a solution to generate the code, but we, ha we have a it checks your, the storage layout of your entire project. So in that case, you can use our code, right? So I would say always use the tooling of whoever is providing you the code, the smart contract code of the proxy. Um, were there any attempts to solve this storage collision thing on the EVM or compiler level, like to sandbox each contact, for example? I don't think there's a need to. Um, the way uh, Solidity like destructures arrays and mappings and all that, it, it's it's theoretically impossible to to get a, a collision. So there's no need to sandbox it. The problem with collisions is when people use like a design that's not supported at a language or at a protocol layer like the EVM, right? Um, and they get collisions between two contracts, right? Um, so. So I don't, I, I'm not aware of any attempt at that level to avoid collisions. Is it possible to migrate an open Zeppelin proxy to this one, the router proxy, or would we have to start from scratch? Code-wise, it's pretty much the same. Like, you can use a new universal proxy as your entry point. So you could probably just use that. And the migration is, the, the crazy thing about this is that the, the route, routing occurs at, in the, at the implementation, right? So code-wise, you're okay. Then uh, storage-wise, right, you just need to probably choose new namespaces and populate the data, right? Or accept that your modules are going to use uh, existing storage, right? And make sure that new modules uh, declare like a new namespace or something. But yeah, sure, you can do it. Even if, so, if, if Solidity like makes this a language feature, you just stop using uh, generated routers and deploy a Solidity hub, right? 
So it's completely future-proof, I think. Ale, uh, how standardized it is, is this proxy? Are you, are you the only ones using it, or is someone else using it in production? That's my first question. And the second question is, uh, do you think it, it will be useful to have something in the, uh, like a public function in the, in the proxy to share the signatures that are being used? So let's say a user or someone that wants to check what is being used don't, doesn't have to dive into the source code? Yep. Uh, so standards, not many. Um, right now, if you deploy this, you won't see anything on Etherscan, for example. Etherscan doesn't know how to interpret a proxy that has multiple implementations, which is unfortunate, but we're trying to solve that pretty fast. It's, it shouldn't be hard. Um, and your second question, um, you would just add a, a module that adopts ERC-165, is it? that uh, just like uh, re replies, it, it, it has that function. I don't remember the name of the function. That gives you the entire interface of the whole system. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.